All right, hey guys, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started here in a few minutes. Um, but if you haven't already, make sure you guys go ahead and uh, follow us on our, in our Instagrams and our Facebook uh, at, I'm gonna put it in the chat here for y'all. But it's SPXYM1, and that's for Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Twitter. Um, and that way y'all can get the most up-to-date news because I don't think, you, I, don't, I mean, emails always suck to, to watch and stuff. So uh, if I can get you on Instagram or Facebook, it's way better for everybody. So plus you get super nice, awesome quotes uh, of saints. Like uh, the recently I've been posting about the new blessed that our church has. Uh, he just got uh, beatified on the 10th, so yesterday, uh, newest saint, so he was really cool. Blessed Carlos. Also, if, if just so I can see you guys um, in your faces, if you could please put on your cameras, that would also be great. That way I'm not just talking to a blank screen of names. Also, uh, I'm going to need a reader for today. So if anyone wants to type into the chat, um, to volunteer, that'd be great. Sweet. Okay, I got a reader. Okay, one more minute. Oh, just kidding. We're going to get go ahead and get started uh, right now. So welcome, guys, to confirmation number two. Last, last month, we talked about uh, kind of the foundations of faith. So why believe in anything at all? Why believe in a God? Um, so this, this month, we're going to focus on the next step in this kind of questioning and searching of our faith. So why do we believe in Jesus? If we believe in a God and we think that's reasonable, uh, why should we believe in this Jesus guy? So today we're going to start um, in prayer with a scripture reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew. You can see, um, let's see, you getting that? Yes, you are. All right. Uh, Brian, if you want to go ahead and get us started, and we'll begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So we're going to have a short little video here. Uh, 
that'll kind of break open today's topic as well. So let me change gears here real quick. Do you ever think about your final breath? Your last breath on earth before you die. Do you ever stop to think about it? When it's going to happen, where it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. I never did. I never thought about death when I was young. And then I found myself in a hospital room. My grandfather was, was lying there and he's dying. And he meant the world to me. And I remember in that moment, 16 years old, and I was thinking, I would give anything in the world if he could just live a little while longer. Just one more month, Lord, one more year, five more years, God, I'd give anything, God. And I started to see not only how beautiful life is, but how fragile life is. And as I watched him die, he died with a lot of peace because he knew this God that I didn't know real well yet. I remember in that moment, I asked myself, how long am I going to live? When's my last breath going to be? I started thinking because I never really stopped to think about it before. And the reality is we're all going to die. And like it or not, our loved ones, our family members, at some point, they're all going to breathe their last breath. Say that your mom or your dad was really ill. And say that they really needed healing. And you tried different doctors and different doctors were basically saying, look, there's nothing else we can do. But you'd heard about a doctor. You'd heard about a doctor maybe a couple towns over. And this doctor had a perfect record for healings. That this doctor, through some gift, was able to diagnose someone's sickness, someone's condition, that they were able to, to actually heal them through surgery or procedures, that they'd never lost a patient, that anyone who came to this doctor sick left healed. Now, wouldn't you stop at nothing to get your, your mom or your dad, your loved one, to see that doctor? Even if you couldn't get an appointment, wouldn't you just wouldn't you just wait in the parking lot outside of the doctor's office just for the chance? I mean, a doctor like that, their fame would grow so quickly, they wouldn't be able to be in public. They couldn't go to a restaurant, to a mall, because everyone would be following them, getting in front of them, begging them. I mean, they'd be trapped in their home. People would be trying to push down the doors and come through windows, come through a roof, anything they could do just for the chance that this man or this woman could heal your loved one. But the reality is at some point, no matter how great a healer that doctor is going to die. And that no matter how we try to control our lives, that at some point we're all going to die. You know, people have a lot of different ideas, a lot of different notions about that guy Jesus of Nazareth, that carpenter from that tiny little town of Nazareth. You know, they had him back in the day too. It wasn't like back in the day, everybody believed that Jesus was God. Some people thought, hey, he's just this sort of political figure. You know, he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna lead the overthrowing of Rome. Other people thought, you know, hey, he's just sort of a, a magician or a wonder worker. Others thought, hey, he's this sort of like itinerant rabbi teacher. The same way today, people look back and they say, you know, he was just a historical figure. He was just a philosopher, just a teacher. And you know, nothing's really changed. You and I still have to make the decision. Jesus looked at them and still today he looks at you and I and he says, who do you say that I am? Here's the reality. That out of, out of all the people that started major religions, all the, the great leaders and teachers of other religions, none of them ever claimed to be God. You had different people who claimed to have insights into God, insights into life. Jesus Christ, the carpenter from Nazareth, he actually claimed to be God. And he did things that no one could explain, that no one else could do. He didn't just turn water into wine, just multiply loaves. He healed the sick. He cured the lame. Jesus Christ healed the blind. Jesus Christ did things. He raised people from the dead. He died and he rose. I mean, we're talking about not just 11 or not just 40 or 70. We're talking about thousands of people whose lives changed almost overnight. We're talking about people who followed him to the ends of the earth, people who offered their own lives as martyrs to do what? To protect a lie? Jesus didn't just have a perfect record of healing, 
But the reality is that Christ came to heal us on a deeper level, a spiritual level. Jesus actually claimed to be able to forgive sins. Jesus came to restore us. He came that we wouldn't die, that we would live. He saw that, that death was, was more than just physical death, that death was sin, that sin is spiritual death. And he said, you don't have to die. I will give you the opportunity to live for eternity. And this is the decision, this is the choice, this is the opportunity that he gives us still today. The question is not about when we're gonna die. The question is whether or not we truly want to live. So where do you stand with Jesus? I mean, we all have a different story. We all have a different background and families and, and, and opinions. I mean, maybe, maybe you were raised in a really, really Christian home and you just had the Jesus and the gospel just kind of crammed down your throat and you just, you're tired of it, you're done with it. Or maybe, maybe you were raised in a home, uh, an atheist home, agnostic home, where, where you never ever even conceived that this could be a reality. Or maybe you're just a, an academic and just far too logical, far too many historical facts or lack thereof you know, for you to actually have any sense of faith that, that this could be true. Maybe you've just made up your mind that you don't want to know. Maybe you, maybe you decided that ignorance is bliss, that the less you know, the less you can be held accountable for. Or maybe you've heard about the gospel. Maybe you've been introduced to Jesus at, at church or in your family or, or in religion class. And you know what? The idea of following him was just going to cost you too much. It was going to be too scary. It was going to mean you had to change your life and you wouldn't be in control and that's not attractive. Whatever your story is, here's the reality that you have to wrap your mind around. That we have a God who loves us so much that he would rather die than risk spending eternity without you. And even if you were the only person on the planet, that Jesus Christ still would have gone to the cross to save you. You know, the reality is that he's not just a teacher, and he's not just a miracle worker, and he's not even just a healer. He is a savior, and he came to save us. He came to save you. And you might be under the impression that, you know what, that Jesus isn't interested in you, that you have too much sin, too much shame, too much guilt, you've done too much, you've, you've gone too far, you've said too much, that he would never be able to forgive you, that he doesn't want any part of you, and you're wrong. Jesus didn't come just to save the saints, just the people you see on the stained glass windows. Jesus came to save those who mock him, those who deny him, those who doubt him, those who struggle with him. Jesus came to save all of us because we are all sick, we are all wounded, we are all hurting, we are all in need of his mercy and his love. He knows the depths of your fears, he knows the causes of your stresses and your anxieties, and he wants you to live in freedom. And only when you experience the freedom that Jesus offers, the mercy that Jesus offers, can you ever live a life of joy. Can you ever fulfill your actual vocation that God created you for? Your question shouldn't just be, what's going to happen with my last breath? Your question should be, how can I give my next breath to Jesus, my next breath to God? How can I have God in my life even more? How can I experience the mercy of God every single day? As you experience God's mercy, you will grow in mercy for others. As you experience God's compassion, God's love, you will become more loving, more compassionate with others. Your life could be better than you've ever possibly fathomed, but it's only possible with a relationship with Jesus. Without Jesus, your life will be an unsolvable riddle. Jesus offers you peace. The question you need to answer is whether or not you'll take him up on his offer. back to PowerPoint. Make sure it's on there. Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to play a little game. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to play this game. And what we're going to do is we're going to put you in the chat. Um, so 
what we're going to play is called Real or Fake Jesus. So this, this is a game. We're going to throw up a quote, and you're going to try and answer uh, whether or not you believe this is the real, this is a real Jesus quote, or if you think this is a, a fake Jesus quote or something from like a movie or a song or whatever. So uh, make sure you put your guess in the comment or in the chat. So we're going to start here with this quote. All you need is love. Do you think this is a Jesus quote or do you think this is a fake Jesus quote? All right, so we're getting a lot of people saying fake. We got one person saying fake the Beatles. That is correct. This is a Beatles song. All right. Next question or next quote. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Fake or real? True just because everyone else is saying false. Love it. All right, yeah, everyone's saying real. All right, yes, this is real. This is from the Gospel of John. All right, I did not come to bring peace but the sword. Is this real or is this fake? Oh, man. Okay. A lot of people are saying fake. Some people are saying real. This is actually a real Jesus quote. This is from the Gospel of Luke. I know. It's quite, it's quite the quote. All right. Next one. Whoever puts all his trust in God, he will be enough for him. Is this real or is this fake? A lot of people saying real. We're getting a few fakes. This one's actually fake. This is from uh, the Quran. So this is the Islamic uh, scripture. Next, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. Real or fake? Oh man, this one's split down the middle, half and half. Some people say it's real, some people say it's fake. This was a trick question. This is Mother Teresa. This is not from Jesus. So it's close and I give you credit for it, but not Jesus. All right. It takes strength to resist evil. Only the weak embrace it. Is this real or is this fake? A lot of people saying real, a lot of people saying real, some people saying fake. Uh, this is actually an Obi-Wan Kenobi quote from The Clone Wars. So y'all need to get uh, Disney Plus and watch that because it's a great series, but no, sadly not Jesus. All right, this one. It is not the, he the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Is this real or is this fake? Yeah, everybody's coming in saying real. This is real. This is from the Gospels as well. All right. This one. Nothing in life is promised except death. Real or fake?
Everybody is saying fake. We got one real. <laughs> Will knows where this, this is Kanye. This is not Jesus. All right, and then this is the last one. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise, real or fake. Nice. All right. Everybody's coming in saying real. Yes, this is real. This is the golden rule. This is where we get that uh, lovely story of the golden rule from is from the Gospels as well. So um, you guys actually did pretty well. I'm, I'm uh, pretty proud. Not going to lie. Uh, so let's uh, just go over a little brief recap of the last meeting because that was like a month ago. Uh, we talked about why believe. Why do we believe in anything at all? So we, we talk about how we use our reason to understand the world around us. So we can perceive things that are physical as well as not physical. We can think of things. We can, we can think of mathematics. We can think of theories and we can hypothesize. We use our reason to understand the world around us, both physical and non-physical. So this is how we obtain to know God is by using our reason and our intellect. We also talked about how science and revelation can go hand in hand. They're not meant to take, overtake one or the other or disprove each other, but they're actually supposed to be to work together to be able to see the entirety of creation, the entirety understanding of the world around us. Um, and then we all believe in something and belief is part of being human. We believe in other people's opinions. We believe in other people speaking truthfully. We believe in other people's ability to accomplish things. We believe in religion, we believe in ourselves. Everything we do has some type of belief. So we have this dispensity uh, towards believing in something. So we must believe, um, even if that's a non-belief, believing that there's nothing there at all, we still believe in something. So we talked a little bit about Aquinas' five proofs about how, how we come to know that there is a God it doesn't have to be the Christian God, but a God in existence. Why is there something instead of nothing? Why is there a design? Why, um, why do we have a, uh, a, a perceived end? Why, why do we have goodness and morals? Um, those are some of his arguments for God uh, in his existence. And then we also talked about how God isn't this aloof and active thing. He's not that something that's just kind of out there, but he's a real and personal being. Uh, God continually wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to be known and he wants to enter into a relationship with us. Um, and so how does God do this? Well, he does this as we do with each other. We do this through word, through speaking, through revealing each other with each other. So he uses this in scripture or the spoken word of God. So Jesus actually comes from the, Ju er, from the Judaic uh, faith. Um, he was a Jew when he was born. He was a very devout Jew. So where is Jesus coming from when he uh, comes into the picture, into history? So God's revelation is believed by the Jews to be the Torah and the prophets and the law. We get this in their, it, basically the Old Testament for us is their scriptures. Um, and so God is shown to reveal himself through speech. So God says, let there be light and there is light. He says, let there be the earth and all that is in it, and it becomes into being. So God breathes and speaks things into being. And so this is the same thing with the, the word, the scripture. God reveals himself through speech. Uh, and so he reveals himself to his, to his people. So Abraham and Moses and Elijah and Jacob and all of the people in the Old Testament, he reveals himself more fully to his people uh, and that he wants to reside with them. He wants to be with them always. In fact, with Moses, uh, God, they build a tent specifically to hold God in there so that they, Moses can talk with God one-to-one -one. Uh, because God wants to reside with us. He wants to be with us and he wants to bring about his kingdom and he wants to save everybody. It doesn't, he doesn't want some people to be saved and other people that he's okay with just letting die. No, he wants everyone to be saved. Um, and so we realize throughout scripture that, uh, humans kind of suck at being human. We're really bad at being good. 
and so we constantly keep screwing up and God has to come save us. And he's like, all right, you guys, uh, I'll, I'll do this one more time, but you really got to do these rules because this is actually what you're made to do. Uh, and then we're like, all right, cool. Awesome. And then a few hundred years later, we stop doing that. And then everything sucks again. And we're like, wow, why does life suck? Probably because we're not doing a whole lot of good. So God's like, all right, this is the game plan here. I'm going to send the Messiah. I'm going to send my anointed one. He's going to be your savior. He is going to bring about my kingdom upon the earth. And once and for all, he's going to save us. Um, and finally, we also find that scripture is not just a religious document. So it does talk about God and revelation and how the earth was formed and religious truths. Um, but we also see that it's an historical one. So the entirety of the Old Testament goes through the historical uh, journey of the Judaic people throughout their history. And we also see God is continually acting through history. He doesn't act just once at a time, but he's constantly being present with his people and constantly acting. And so scripture points towards God wanting to know and to be known by his people. So how can somebody become more personal uh, than to be in that person's shoes? I cannot truly understand what a, uh, a, a waiter goes through unless I become a waiter at a restaurant. And so God does the same thing. And this is really incredible uh, claim that Jesus makes here. And we'll get to that. Um, but one last thing is that God wants to save his people. This is what he wants. He wants to be known and to be known, to love and to be loved. Um, and so he needs to save them. Because as we see in Genesis, Adam and Eve, because they reject God and, being, and listening to him, it brings sin into the world. It brings a lack. It brings pain and suffering, um, and it causes us to fall. Uh, it's, and we, we are removed from eternal life because we enter into death, and we lose our way. We, we, our, our reason is corrupted, and we're not able to truly undersee and understand and see truth for what it is. So this is where Jesus comes in. Jesus comes around zero A.D., um, although most people think that it's like 7 BC because some Gregorian monk screwed up the calendar at some point. Um, doesn't matter. Around that time, Jesus comes in. And what do we know about Jesus? We know that Jesus was a man. Jesus grew up. He was born. He learned and he developed like we do. And so this is a strange thing because if we believe that Jesus is God, which he claims to be, uh, Jesus is saying that God learns to be human. He grows up and becomes human. God, who is uh, unchanging, knows everything, is everywhere all at once, decides to become human, to become temporary, to become uh, a learner, to somebody who changes, to somebody who suffers. Jesus suffered. He cries for his friend who has just died, and he himself suffered and died for us. Um, and so he is a really and truly man. He ate, he drank, he got, he got angry, he felt emotions. He was a real man. Uh, Jesus was also an historical figure. So we see this in the Gospels because we remember that scripture is a, uh, it's a historical document as well as a religious one. So we see that the Gospels, um, we, we figure that the Gospels are true because we use the same metric that we do for historical documents as we do with the Bible. So there's discontinuity. Jesus comes and says things that are radical, that are changing, that he goes against what, his, what the Judaic law and the leaders were saying. And nobody would have recorded that unless uh, Jesus actually said those things. Next, embarrassment. Uh, things that are kind of shocking um, that they wouldn't record unless actually happened. So like when Jesus tells Mary Woman, how does your concern affect me? Or Jesus being baptized, or Jesus falling while carrying the cross and crying. Um, they wouldn't really have recorded these things unless these are things that actually happened. Um, next is multiple attestations. So we have multiple different accounts from different people at different times about the same events happening. So this is how we know that the events of Jesus' life are true because multiple people said it at the same time continuity. So Jesus does things that are typical for the people of his time. So he speaks in Aramaic. 
Uh, he is a devout Jew. He, he observes Passover. Um, he, and he does all of the things that a typical Jew would do during this time. And also Aramaism. So Jesus didn't speak English. He didn't speak uh, Latin as the church has most of its stuff in. Uh, but he spoke Aramaic, which was typical to uh, where he was in Judea. And so uh, the scripture writers who are talking about Jesus have what's called Aramaism. So they explain the definition of Aramaic words in there because that's what Jesus was actually saying. So they have to explain it to people who don't speak that language, uh, what Jesus actually meant. And so we also know that Jesus is a teacher and a prophet. So he taught in the synagogues. He was called teacher by his, uh, by his uh, accompanying people. He debated with the Pharisees who were also teachers of the time and he used parables to explain his teachings. Um, but he also prophesied. So prophets came to speak on behalf of God. So he prophesied of the coming kingdom that he was establishing and he spoke on behalf of God uh, because well, he is God. He is the incarnate word. That's at least what he's claiming here. And then finally, yes, Jesus claims to be God. And this is a radical statement because no other prophet or holy person in the history of any religion has ever claimed to be God himself. It's always been a representative, somebody who's writing on behalf of the God being a prophet. But Jesus is the first and the only to say, no, I am God. And so this is a big claim that Jesus is making. So why should we believe Jesus at all? Well, Jesus, if he is saying, if what he says to be true, uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan to know and to be known by his creation. Because Jesus is yes to suffer and to die for the sake of others. And Mary's yes to follow God's will to allow God to become human is the reverse of Adam and Eve's no. So Adam and Eve rejected their humanity while Jesus and God himself ultimately accepts humanity for the sake of our salvation. Uh, Jesus in his ministry on earth fulfills over 600 Old Testament prophecies. There's a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament, and they've ranged from being made about 3,500 years before Jesus's birth to about 500 years before Jesus's birth. There are all these prophecies that talk about the Messiah and the Judaic people's uh, destiny in the eyes of God. And Jesus, Jesus fulfills all of them. It's insane the odds that that could be unless that's actually true and they're actually speaking about Jesus. Um, next, Jesus performs miracles throughout scripture um, and that those demons that Jesus casts out through exorcism uh, claim to know him. They call him the son of God um, and Jesus has the power over those demons which cannot be exercised by anyone except God. Next, his teachings live on after his death. So during this time in history, there are a lot of people saying a lot of different things and a lot of different faiths. Um, but when those teachers died, usually their teachings kind of fizzled out with them. Uh, but this wasn't the case with Jesus. Something was about Jesus's teachings and his ministry that stuck on with the apostles that we see during Passover um, that they were afraid that they were going to be murdered, that the Jews were going to kill them, that the Romans were going to kill them, that their leader was already dead. So what's the point? Even Simon, the first Pope, Simon Peter, went back to his old job as being a fisherman because he was like, well, my job here is done. Jesus is dead. There's no point in doing this anymore. But Jesus is claimed to be resurrected, that Jesus comes back from the dead. And all of a sudden, all those apostles all those people who follow Jesus suddenly come out of hiding and speak boldly and be and they're even in face of torture and in death. They all across the entire Middle Eastern world at different times all have the same exact story that Jesus rose from the dead. And they continue to pass on the same faith throughout history. So this claim that Jesus died and was resurrected, if true, is it's the biggest event of history. It's so history changing in fact that we based our entire calendar over it that 2000 years later in the year 2020 we still base our calendar after the event of Jesus's birth death and resurrection and so why is this such a big statement because if what Jesus said is true and that he died and resurrected that means he really is God 
And so everything that Jesus has taught is true. And not only this, but Christianity can't be a dead faith. It's not something that some dead guy a thousand years ago talked about, but the guy who revealed it, who taught it, is alive today because he is resurrected in a new life. And so humanity is also resurrected with Christ because God became man and died like a man. And when he resurrected, he brought all of humanity back into heaven with himself. And so that veil is torn. The fall of Adam, um, all the sin and emptiness that we had um, were brought back to life. And then finally, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and always. So Jesus is always with us, um, always continuing to help pass on his faith, um, guiding it through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so this is such a bold claim. And I'm not the only one who claims that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. Um, we actually have one of our very own to give a witness uh, on why he believes in Jesus. So Brian, you can go on ahead. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian, if you haven't met me before, and I am one of the leaders here helping out today. And yeah, so Kyle asked if I could give a witness on why do I believe in Jesus. And so I grew up kind of like I assume a lot of um, similar to how a lot of you did, where I was raised by Catholic parents. I went to a Catholic school. Uh, so between the theology classes I took, the masses I went to um, on the weekends and during school, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and just all the teachers and coaches I had, uh, it, it was really not hard for me to say that I believe in Jesus, um, just because <clears throat> there were always those people around me that kind of instilled that in me just from a really young age. But then I started thinking that, um, like, there are people throughout history and even today in the world that are persecuted for saying that they believe in Jesus. And so I thought that there must be something deeper to their belief than just, like, it being an easy thing to say yes that they believe in Jesus there has to be some some reason that they uh that they believe in Jesus actively and so once I started considering that that's when I really asked myself why why do I believe in Jesus like uh, is it just something that was kind of handed to me and I just took in or uh, is it something that I personally believe on my own uh and so at first the answer honestly was that it was convenient it's it's convenient to believe in Jesus when um like everyone around you is Catholic. So uh, I was, I was raised Catholic. And so I just continued that. And uh, it's pretty convenient just to be able to go to church uh, once a week for an hour, you know, and then you, uh, you go to reconciliation and then your sins are forgiven. And before you know it, you'll be up in heaven, uh, just hanging out with your friends. But then the thing I didn't really consider in that uh, little doctrine I had going on in my head is that, um, you know, believing in Jesus isn't just something that you can compartmentalize to, you know, a, a week or an hour out of the week while you're at mass or uh, while you're at reconciliation or while you're at adoration or anything. It's something that has to be um, the guiding force in your life. So believing in Jesus isn't really a passive thing. It's, it's an action to believe in Jesus. So once I realized that I had to believe or I had to uh, consider for myself, do I really personally believe in Jesus or is it, um, again, just something that it's just not worth it to me because it's not it's not always convenient you know it's it's something that takes time and effort uh to truly believe in jesus so um we don't have a ton of time so i can't tell you you know all the reasons that i've chosen to believe in jesus and why i continue to do that every day uh, but here's some of the big ones so the first is and it was kind of touched on in the video is that <clears throat> even non-christians believe that jesus was a real person just a historical figure so if you take religion out of it entirely um it's pretty agreed upon that there is a man named, named Jesus walking around around 30 AD um, in that geography. And if he wasn't doing miracles, it was at least really convincing magic. Uh, probably one of the best magicians we've ever seen. So um, at the most basic level, we can agree that there was someone walking around healing people um, and doing the things that we believe Jesus does. So if we can agree that Jesus is, you know, a, a real person, then um, I like to use the acts, or like, the things that Jesus did while he was on earth to guide the rest of my faith. So first, uh, the, the acts that Jesus did on earth, uh, he, did a, he lived a pretty short life, uh, you know, and a lot of what we hear about him in the gospels happened over a span of just like uh, about three years, which is 
a really short amount of time. Um, but during that time, he, he could have really just like lived a comfortable life. He could have learned from Joseph to be a carpenter uh, and just kind of lived a comfortable life and done that. But he, instead he chose to go around and he healed the sick. Uh, it's like he, he healed lepers. He held the blind could see again. Uh, he made the paralytics walk uh, and so many more. And something that I think is uh, kind of cool is that you have to remember that those people were not treated very nicely back then. Like the lepers, for instance, it's not like you were taken well care of in a hospital. These are people that were like outcast to the, the outskirts of society. So Jesus wasn't healing these people because uh, they were going to be able to repay him or people were going to like see him do it and he was going to get a lot of followers from it. He, he did it because um, he was sent down there, down from heaven to earth um, to serve us. Um, and so just seeing that he did all those actions on earth when he really didn't have to, he chose to do that uh, is one uh, big reason that I choose to continue to follow Jesus. Um, and secondly, his teachings um, are, he had so many, of course, and the ones that I've come to appreciate more as I've grown up is uh, the Beatitudes that he came and uh, he showed us. Um, and you, I'm sure you remember the Beatitudes from uh, school or Sunday school or um, wherever, but they're blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the land. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be consoled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be so shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And blessed are those who endure persecution for the sake of justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the thing that I really like about the Beatitudes <clears throat> is that they show us that Jesus came down uh, to save people like you and me, like people that aren't perfect, people that, uh, like, we're not just like the high priests who are seen as these perfect Christians who... Uh, never make any mistakes. Um, like we're, we're all sinners and Jesus knows that, but he's saying that uh, despite that, he's going to save us still. Like, for example, when was the last time, um, like maybe you spaced out and mass during the homily and you just like, weren't, weren't the best Christian that you could be that day. Um, in that time, you were probably the poor in spirit, but Jesus is still telling you that uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or maybe uh, if you lost someone that was close to you and it, 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 like it had you questioning your faith, uh, Jesus is telling us that at, at that point, you are one of those who mourn, uh, but you will still be consoled. And so hearing those Beatitudes, um, for me, it's just really comforting to know that Jesus did come down for people of every, uh, every walk of life, you know, uh, so you, me, and everyone else. And so that's another reason that uh, I choose to continue to believe in Jesus. And the last big point that I want to talk about is um, the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist is something that um, I think it's almost easy to kind of grow numb to, unfortunately, because if you see it, you know, every week in mass, um, you, you forget that there's a miracle happening up on the altar when Jesus actually comes down um, and becomes, um, it, that's the body and blood of Christ that we're consuming. Um, and so like when I, when I got into college, I made a lot of friends who were Christian, but they weren't Catholic. And that was, um, we would like talk about our faith and compare the differences and things like that. And that was always something that stood out to me is they believe like when they, when they do communion at their churches, uh, for them, it's just a symbol of, it's a, it's a reminder of the time that Jesus came down, uh, and, and sacrificed himself to save us. Uh, but for me, understanding that the Eucharist is Jesus coming down continually again and again, choosing to make that sacrifice for us because we are constantly sinning, but he continues to make that decision to uh, save us every single day. Um, that's, that's something that's uh, pretty unbelievable really. And so that's um, one, another big reason why I continue to believe in Jesus. And I think you should too. Um, so those are some of the, the biggest reasons that I wanted to talk about today. Um, but even if you like understand all those things, it's not always easy to continue to believe because um, there's going to be difficult decisions you have to make. And maybe some people are going to question your faith um, or maybe you're, you, you will question your own faith. Uh, and so one thing that I found helps me um, in those difficult times is um, having an answer to the question, who do you say that Jesus is? Uh, because if you can articulate like who you say Jesus is, what, 
what you believe about Jesus, then um, you'll be able to kind of dispel some of those doubts that come up within you or around you. And that's a pretty loaded question. So you might not have an answer to that question right away. And that's okay. Um, just consider that. Um, and uh, at, as you go through this confirmation process, just try to try to form an answer to who do you say that Jesus is. And uh, hopefully that'll kind of help you stay a little bit stronger in your faith. Uh, and so with that, I will pass it back to Kyle. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. All right. Thank you so much for that awesome testimony. That was great. Um, um, now, that is the end of our catechetical portion. We are going to go ahead and you guys can come over for small groups. If you guys forgot what your small groups are, here are your small group breakdowns. Remember that small groups one through three are coming from four to 450. Uh, groups four to six are coming from five to 550. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at SPXYM1. Uh, and we have live teen every Sunday night at 630 to 8. So we'll see you guys over there. See ya.